Today, I want to talk to you guys about texture, one of the most important parts of your chocolate tasting good. And I think it's an overlooked part of the experience, but everyone subconsciously or consciously uh, experiences. And so when I eat a chocolate bar, what I do first is after looking at it, after maybe smelling or breaking it, I put it in my mouth and I chew it. And a lot of people say, don't chew your chocolate bar. I disagree. I like to chew it because what I'm looking for is texture and what I often experience if the chocolate is not refined sufficiently, I get a grittiness on my teeth, almost like really wet sandpaper or really fine grit. I'll feel that subtlety on my teeth and the roof of my mouth. Um, so I like to chew it a few times. And then what I'll do is I'll use my tongue and spread out the chocolate after it's starting to melt. And then I can experience the chocolate enrobing the rest of my palate because the cocoa butter is then melting. And so maybe we should jump into that a little bit. Once we roast the cacao seed, once we winnow it and we have nibs, we crush that up and what you have is cocoa solids and cocoa butter and it's about half half. And so you have cocoa butter and then cocoa solids mainly being cocoa powder. And so the cocoa butter is melting and that's when you chew it up and you use your tongue and you spread it out in your mouth or chocolate just melts in general, that's cocoa butter melting. It's a really nice texture. And this is why a lot of companies add cocoa butter because the texture often is perceived as being improved. This is a style. I like this style, which is why Manoa chocolate adds somewhere around 10% cocoa butter to our dark chocolates consistently on every single one of them. Um, and then milk, you'd have to add more, but different conversation. So the texture is allowing you to taste better. If it's gritty, it's like having a bunch of noise. You can't hear as well. So to me, when you have a perfect texture, you can really taste the subtleties that are going on, the nuances that are really pretty or maybe not so pretty in that chocolate bar. All right, so there's different ways to do this. There's stone ground chocolate, there's roller milled chocolate, and then there's ball mills. Now, most people start with stone grinders. When you're beginning to make chocolate, it's the most affordable option. It has the most appeal if you're explaining to people because it's very easy to understand. And so we started with tiny little stone grinders and grew into bigger stone grinders. So we went from maybe a couple kilos to 20 to 25 kilo grinders, stone grinders. And now we have ball mills. The reason that we graduated, I'd like to say graduated, to ball mills or looked at roller mills as well is because you can improve the texture by using better machines. Now when we add nibs into a stone melanger, it refines very well. It's really the sugar that we had issues with. And when you add sugar, sugar is a crystal and it's going under these stones and there's a stone base and it's fracturing the sugar crystals and they get smaller and smaller and smaller as they spend more time refining, up to days, up to three, maybe even four days. But you have to constantly scrape the sides, the shaft, the sides of the wheels, because sugar will get stuck on, on the side and not refine as much in one area and over refine in another. And so what we were finding is we ended up with um, micron sizes, which is the way you'd measure the, the uh, how small a particle might get of five microns all the way to 25 microns and this is a really big distribution curve and you can measure this with something called a grindometer not as not perfectly but it gives you an idea of what's going on as far as the size of the chocolate now when we went to ball mills what we found is the way ball mills work is there's lots of balls that start smashing together as the chocolate works its way through a big cylinder of up to a hundred, hundreds of thousands of balls. And then it gets pumped and drops back on top and recirculates all the way through, constantly being refined, but extremely evenly. And so this is a very fine distribution curve of the micron size, as opposed to the stone melangers, which is a big distribution curve. Now, the most important thing is your cacao, obviously. 
if you have really good cacao, really good beans, and you do a great roast, you're going to get good flavored chocolate. But the stone melangers, we found we had issues on the texture, especially after the stone melangers were a year, two, three years old. It just wasn't performing as well. When we went to Ball Mills, we were achieving 15, 16 microns pretty consistently in hours. And what we noticed is our chocolate tasted better to us. Uh, roller mills are the other way to go. Big industry likes to use this. They're just total workhorses, but they're massive. And you have to do things like reinforce the concrete floors because they're so heavy. And if there is anything, any imperfection in it, it's tens of thousands of dollars to fix the stone, the, the, um, the steel rollers that do this refining. Imagine you have steam rollers stacked on top of each other and the chocolate is passing through the, the refined material and it can only go through something very, very tight. And so you're going to achieve that size, that micron size for sure, because that's the only way to get to the other end out the other side. So workhorses, great machines. It's more of a bigger industry type of thing. You do see craft chocolate makers using three roll refiners. You don't see very many using five roll refiners, which is the way the bigger industry would work. And this is where I see Kraft Chocolate has a lot of opportunity to learn from the bigger industry because they know how to make chocolate very well. They're just not trying to make really good chocolate. They're trying to mass produce chocolate for a mass produced market. So what Manoa Chocolate is trying to do is learn from them in the form of equipment and automation so that we can do the same thing except making really, really good chocolate consistently as we scale. Uh, so just to quickly explain a grindometer, which is how we do measure our texture. This is a really simple tool and what it has is a bunch of pores, a bunch of little, little holes starting from the top here all the way down and there's a bunch of numbers on the side. So 50 would represent 50 microns. And so up at the top here, the pores are larger. They're at roughly 50 microns. As it goes down, it's getting smaller and smaller, tighter and tighter and tighter. So when you put a dab of chocolate at the top and you use this squeegee and you go down this center line, it'll fill in until it is approximately the micron size that is too small that it won't fill in the pores anymore. So if it fills in, it means it's refined to that size and it's not going to be perfect. You're still going to have larger micron sizes and you're going to have some smaller ones. But when it's roughly in the middle of where you see it stop filling in, that's about the size of your micron of your chocolate texture. And what we find is people do not distinguish texture beyond or lower than 20 microns. So we're constantly shooting for under 20 microns for our chocolate. It just tastes better to us and as well as to what we find most people's palates. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode on texture. Thanks for joining us again. We'll see you next time. Aloha.